webinars have um, started to level off. So I will start with the webinar now. Um, first, welcome to um, everybody who has joined us as participants and a massive welcome and a thank you to our panellists. We're going to meet them all in a bit more detail, but I'll just briefly run through who we've got with us today. So I'm personally very pleased to be welcoming Sava, um, who is a journalist, blogger and the editor of Made Possible. And also, I should say, um, a very old friend of mine. I don't mean that in terms of age, Sava. I just mean that we've known each other a very long time um, from when we went to journalism college together. Um, and it's fantastic to have you here today. Um, and I'm also do, delighted to welcome um, Matthew Hellett, who is an award winning filmmaker and features in the um, book Made Possible. We've got David Matthews here from Grace Air, and we've also got Jane from um, Creative Future. Um, and I think there's a few threads running through the webinar today. So we're going to be talking a little bit about how people have been adapting um, at this time, adapting services and personal communications. But it's also um, a real celebration, I think, of um, creativity um, and the impact that creativity can have on individuals lives um, and also um, I know Ma um, David is going to be talking about the friendship group um, and I'm also mindful that um, we're specifically celebrating that for um, learning disability week this week so that's very timely um, so welcome to everybody and I will just uh, move on now um, a little bit of housekeeping. As you can see, there are captions appearing at the bottom of the screen. Those are provided by the PowerPoint presentation. They're not perfect, um, but hopefully they are good enough for um, everyone to follow along if those are useful for you. We will be using the Q&A window to ask questions. So if you have any questions, please do pop those in there, either for the panellists. Um, my colleague Annie is kindly joining us today and she's keeping an eye on that. Um, if you're used to using the chat window, we've got that turned off today. Um, that's because um, it doesn't work so well for people who might be using a screen reader to access the webinar. Um, so yeah, just use the Q&A window and, and myself and Annie will keep an eye on that. Um, following the webinar, we will be making slides, a transcript and a recording. Um, there will be an email that goes out to everybody afterwards, so you'll be able to see that. Um, and a feedback form, um, we would welcome any feedback about the webinar or any of the issues that come up today. Um, and I know we've received a couple of emails already with some questions. Um, we haven't had time to look in those in great depth yet, but um, thank you very much for sending them through and some of those themes may come up during the webinar today. So welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm going to start in a second by just introducing AbilityNet um, and how we can help people. Um, as I said, we'll be meeting our panellists in a bit more depth afterwards. Um, and then we will be having um, a panel discussion. I'll be keeping an eye on the time and making sure that we have time for your voices to be heard um, at the end as well and to ask any questions. Start asking them now in the Q&A box. Um, and as I say, Annie and myself are keeping an eye on that and we'll come back to it later. So just briefly to introduce AbilityNet, um, we are a charity and we believe in a digital world that is accessible for everyone. Um, we support people at home, at work and in education. Um, we have a network of over 300 volunteers um, who in, in normal times would visit people at home. We are providing um, support remotely and you can call our helpline on the free number that is listed on screen. So that number is 0800 048 7642. Um, and you'll be able to look that up in the slides afterwards. We also have some online support that we can offer to people. We have a product called My Computer My Way, which will tell you at quite a granular level how to adapt the operating systems across a range of devices, um, if that's helpful. Um, and we also have a range of free fact sheets available. So yeah, if, if that's helpful to people, do have a look at those um, sources afterwards. Um, 
Just briefly, we know that what we do makes a difference to our clients um, from a volunteer intervention. We know that 80% of people are better able to use technology, but we also monitor um, you know, more social impact and 76% um, feel more independent, for example, and 69% of people who have an intervention from one of our volunteers feel less isolated. And we keep an eye on those numbers and it's great to know that for us, it's not just about the technology, it's about making a difference and ensuring that people are, are able to make the changes that they want to. So I'm gonna come over to our panelists now. As I said, I'd just like to um, introduce Saba. Um, Saba, are you okay to pop off mute there? Great, who is, as I said, for disclosure, um, a really good friend of mine, and I'm really delighted to have her here today. So, um, Saba, there's a, a biography here covering all the many things that you've done, but um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about Made Possible, the book which has been released during the pandemic, and, and just tell us about that and how it came about. Sure. Well, thank you so much um, for inviting me on. And um, yes, full disclosure, we are we are old friends. Um, so um, Made Possible is uh, a project and a book that came about uh, purely because of my younger sister, Rana, and she has a learning disability, Fragile X Syndrome. And growing up, it was very obvious to me that she didn't really get asked the question that most of us get asked as kids which is, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And there was no sense in a way that she was extended the same um, treatment, really, that um, somehow success and aspiration and, and uh, ambition, all of those things that, you know, we, I suppose we, ex yeah, we extend to most people, it just didn't apply to her. Um, so Made Possible is a book that seeks to challenge those stereotypes. And so instead of sort of pitying or patronizing people, um, it explains and it reveals that actually, you know, we're all human. We all have something to contribute. We can all live successful lives. You know, we, we all have a right to do that and to define our own success. But um, yeah, ultimately it's a book to just make people think twice about, um, the kind of a, a population that generally are overlooked and shouldn't be. Great, thank you. And I think what you've said, the other thing is that word, again, I come back to that word celebration, actually, you know, um, I've read it and it just comes across as quite joyful. There's a lot of joy in there, isn't there? It's a real celebration of, of people's achievements. Absolutely. And I think the point is that the achievements in the book, they're remarkable and they really are regardless of whether you have a disability or not these are people who've achieved huge things um and i should also say that that doesn't mean it shies away from some of the challenging stuff um so yes ultimately it's a very joyful uplifting powerful um sort of positive read um as i said that you know the, the main point is to say you know we, we all have value we all have worth and I wonder if you'd like to say a little bit about um, SIBS, because we're going to come on later to talk about, I know um, you and Rana have a really close relationship and um, you've been working really hard to maintain that during really challenging times. Tell us about SIBS and, and why that's important to you. So SIBS is um, a small but mighty charity that I'm a very proud trustee of. Um, and it is the kind of organization that I wish had existed when I was younger, when Rana and I um, and my middle sister, Arby, we were younger. But actually, the, the role of SIBS is to support adult and um, younger siblings of disabled people through life. Um, and it's just a fantastic resource, really. There's not only a sort of a peer network of support, but it really made me identify as a sibling, um, which I know sounds strange, but you know, a lot of the time, the families of uh, disabled people really are, um, are overlooked by a lot of sort of service providers, if you like. So the fact that SIBS exists to really say that, you know, this is a group that also has support needs and plays a vital role in the, in the lives of, of people like my sister. So yeah, I love it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and I think that's a thread we'll also return to um, with Jane and David around 
peer support and mentoring and community supporting each other, which seems even more poignant at the time that we are all living through together at this at this difficult time. So fantastic. Thank you. I've just asked you all these questions. Um, how about, um, it'd be great though to understand about the crowdfunding, because I think that's particularly relevant in terms of some of the challenges, and again, this will resonate with Jane, about getting diverse voices out there and getting them heard. So um, tell us how you went about funding the project. So yeah, the book is crowdfunded with a publisher called Unbound, and I'd never crowdfunded anything in my life, so I was slightly like a rabbit in the headlights with this, but um, the the book was, uh, was was crowdfunded by some fantastic patrons, of which I know you are one, Sarah, an early adopter of Made Possible, so thank you for that. Um, and if anyone joining us um, today is also a supporter, then thank you, because apart from my sister being the reason this book exists, and of course the fantastic contributors like wonderful Matthew, it exists because of the people who got behind it. Um, so in terms of uh, funding it um, practically, it was, uh, technology really was at the heart of, of this project because I used my community and my contacts on social media, um, primarily Twitter and Facebook. And everybody really got behind it and we funded the book in, in six weeks, which is quite astonishing really. And I think that shows the level of support and, and the gap and the demand for something like this. Fantastic, thank you, Sava. Um, so Matthew, um, I think you've joined us there. Um, wonder if you're able to pull yourself off mute or if I can do that for you. Um, no, I don't think I can actually. Are you able to unmute there, Matthew? Yeah. Great, thanks for joining us. Um, I was just wondering if you, I know you're a contributor to Made Possible, it'd be great to hear a little bit about your work and in particular your involvement with um, Oscar Bright. Are you able to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so, um, so basically I've been on Oscar Bright for over 10 years um, but it wasn't until 2016 that I got mentored through Guardian Lights scheme and then then now I'm now a head programmer of Oscar Bright Film Festival and and next year is our is our is our 10th birthday but because we can't tour because of the pandemic um I was also saying to Saba that we've had to put last year's festival all online so it's called Oscar Bites so uh, a screening will go up every month or, or every two months until January next year. Great. And and when does that start from? I oh, know it's already started. So okay. it started um, like the last two weeks of May. Fantastic. Um, and how's it been for you maintaining that creativity um, while you're at, at home and, and keeping that creative? Um, well, it's it's been okay, but I say it 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 has its challenges. Um, um, I was saying to my colleague that um, um, about six weeks ago, I've had to program a, a film festival here in the UK called Barnes Film Festival. That went very well, but what you need to like discipline yourself is like working on deadlines. But I I talked to my colleague Dave. I, I talked to my colleague at Carousel on Zoom or Weirby, which is like a Carousel Arts pro um, project that they, you can spend longer than 40 minutes. Um, and yeah, and so, but I'm um, like, because they just wanted an hour screening. So, but, I'm a, but I got that work all done, so. That's fantastic. It's great to see that that work continues um, online um, and I would encourage people to look out for the online Oscar Bright Film Festival and, and check in on your work there. That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'll just move on from there now. Thank you very much, Matthew. I'll just okay. put you back on mute. Um, so, David. You've already unmuted yourself like a pro. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about Grace Eyre um, and the mission of the charity there. 
Yeah, um, I've been with Grace Air about 14 years now, and uh, it's a, a charity that's highly focused on being user-led by, by our, our, our demographic, and that's people with learning disabilities. And our mission really reflects the voice of people. So um, our mission is to deliver the R Charter, which was actually created through a group of ambassadors doing surveys with people with learning disabilities about what, what they actually want to achieve. Um, and our goal now is to provide every level of support we can to achieve that. And they have very, very, very similar goals to all of us, which is it's really lovely to, to be able to work in this sort of field. So um, the charity is on a long path and has, has been around for a long time as well. Um, and my part of the service is connect to that sort of being part of their community, being able to learn to travel around, being able to learn the skills to uh, be recruited for roles um, and educational things around health and well-being. So I, I, I'm part of the team that deliver group activities that people join. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I think just hold that in mind, that group activity, because it's something we'll be talking about in a second. Um, so start by telling us a little bit about the, the heritage of Grace Air. It's been around for a long time. It has been around for a long time. Um, started by uh, a very progressive person, Grace Air Woodhead herself, um, who was incredibly passionate before most of society even cared, really, um, and started with a simple project of wanting to have the people that were being institutionalized in like the 1900s period um, to have the opportunity to come to the seaside is sort of like that initial impetus and it grew from there um, and and we've just passed 100 years of being formerly a charity but we've existed longer um, it's about 115 120 years that we've been working um, and we're continuing her legacy that was just about people deserve and have the right to a full life, um, whatever that means for that individual. So yeah, it's fantastic to work with a, a charity that's got this legacy and we're doing a massive project at the moment with the Heritage Society to really capture um, that story, but also the, the language shift, the cultural shifts and things like that that have happened through that time. You know, we have a lot of historic documents with a lot of different language that changes all the time. Um, so yeah, there's a really big project going on at the moment around around Grace Air's heritage and therefore also learning disability as a whole. That's brilliant. Um, and I'll just pull these three um, threads together at the end. I know we're going to return to um, the theme of what's changed for you, but um, I think you've been quite busy, haven't you, over the last uh, few months? Tell us a little bit about how you've been having to change and adapt. Yeah, well, if I speak for Active Lives, which is one of the many arms of Grace Air, but we're, we're very much the group community sort of activities, whether they be learning, how for, or um, creative arts. And we obviously, like everybody else, suddenly got this lockdown and we changed from a 99.9% .9 direct delivery to people with people coming together in a very social hub um, to not being able to do that. Uh, and that was uh, a real shift for us. And we've had to be very creative very quickly um, and we will touch on it a bit more I think but we we have our friendship group that switch from being about social activities in the community such as you know just going out for a night to being focused on our Facebook group um, and that's had massive growth over that time and I definitely would talk about it in a little while and the actual group activities we've just started trialing an online series of activities across the week, um, providing activities uh, up to seven days a week um, for groups to come together. And, you know, that's starting to build popularity. It, it's been brilliant to see that transition. Um, at the same time, like many other companies and charities, we're trying to figure our way out of uh, how can we operate within social distancing rules and things like that. So that's a whole different level of the challenge. And we now see that for probably the next nine to 12 months, this online element is going to be really, really important for people to be able to connect. That uh, There may be many groups that, or many individuals that can't come back 
to to measures that we can put in place right now mm, that's great and we will definitely return to these themes but i think what's coming up for me is that um while you're doing really creative things that everybody who's joined us today uh, um actually coming up with creative solutions to some of the challenges that have been presented by the pandemic and i'm really keen that we come back to that as a thread and talk about that in a second as well so thank you very much for that intro um jane over to you from creative future um really delighted to be um joined by you today and i think um those threads are there for you um you're working with people um really really um focus on creativity so tell us a little bit about who you are um, and what you do hi hello everyone um and thanks so much for inviting me to be here it's it's great to have an opportunity to talk about our work um so i've got a cough sorry <clears throat> Apologies. Um, um, so Creative Future was set up in 2007 um, and initially it was an, an artist led organisation. They were two artists who both themselves were living with um, mental health challenges and other challenges. Um, and I think it was it was first set up with an acknowledgement that um, there weren't the opportunities out there for um, for artists who were living with those particular challenges and they wanted to change that and we've been continuing that work now for 13 14 years um, and we it's about individual change for artists um, but it's also about celebrating that diversity and it's also about um, how we can take those diverse voices into the mainstream and 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 look at how um, they can they can bring change on a much larger scale um, for instance we um, we work a lot with writers um, and we run a national um, writing competition the creative future writers awards um, and we have some fantastic national partners now who are supporting that initiative um, for instance we work with um, a big agency called curtis brown curtis brown creative and they run lots of online courses um, in creative writing and they've donated one of their courses as a prize for one of our winners um, but that engagement with the industry um, increasingly their support to have those diverse voices heard um, is really starting to grow and um, the industry absolutely acknowledged that they weren't um, publishing um, enough um, there wasn't enough diversity within the uh, writers that they were publishing and they're starting to acknowledge that um, but we've still got a long way to go um, so really um, what we're about is um, seeing that artist as an individual um, and looking at them and seeing that how we can provide support um, for the work that they want to develop um, and we would just say that if you are an artist who perceives that you have a barrier to opportunity then we'd like to hear from you and we'd like to look at how we might be able to support you in terms of developing your practice and your work um, so as well as running quite specific um, programs of activity uh, we also run a whole range of sort of more uh, drop-in um, opportunities around creative writing and visual arts and absolutely acknowledging that everyone has a creative streak somewhere um, and that we very much in, in, encourage everyone to to explore that that's brilliant thank you and we'll come back to that theme i think about around voices and getting those voices heard which again is another thread that i think unites all of you and and should unite all of us really today so we'll come back to that at some of our panel questions in a second bringing me neatly to our panel discussion. So um, I'll just skip over that for now, a link to future webinars. So it would be great. I think we've touched on, on some of this already around adapting and creative solutions. Um, so I wanted to come to you first, David, if that's okay, to talk a little bit more about um, some of those initiatives that you have mentioned already in terms of adapting, um, particularly the friendship group sounds really interesting. So tell us all about it. Yeah, no. Um, so our, our friendship group, as I explained, is was set up originally to enable people to come together in a social environment to hopefully create friendships that are real and meaningful and can sort of splinter off into their own 
activities. So just like everybody does, you meet up with a small group and one or two people really stand out and then you're having a coffee or going swimming and that's its whole purpose. And as lockdown came uh, to the fore, we recognized that that whole ability to connect was going to be radically um, cut off. So we tasked the friendship coordinator which is a lady called Charlotte who who I have to acknowledge has done amazing at, at the piece of work that they have been doing on this um, was tasked with focusing on our Facebook group page which was really just set up as just a tiny little thing in the background in it and it had only just sort of been reconnected and had about 25 members at that point with not very much going on at the odd post um, and we decided that that would be our source point so we would tell everybody to head to that. And by doing that, we would A, give a mutual space that people felt safe to communicate and we could share updates for them. But also we knew that we would need to get quite a lot of people to get a sense of community functioning within that environment to, to make it feel like something real is there. Um, so we told basically everybody that we connected to, join the Facebook group, go there, that's our one point for connecting right now. And that's done brilliantly. We now have uh, over 166 members of that page. And, you know, what I'm seeing on there now is not things led by Charlotte as it was in the very early days of like, what are people doing this week? What are people doing today? I'm going to bake this. And to people just sharing their story of their day. And posting that they've created something uh, a piece of art uh, a puppet or baked you know we've, we've seen a lot of bread we've even had someone win a prize from one of the bakeries for their bread which was just amazing there and they're able to show that to other people their peers who then comment and engage and say that's amazing oh i'd love to know how to do that so just really great community appearing and it, it's sort of getting its own life now. So um, in the last two weeks, especially, Charlotte's had technical difficulties with internet providers and things like that, which, which has led to some brilliant frustrated photos coming from her. Um, but we've been able to say, well, the Zoom meeting is still there. We won't be there, but go on it and engage. And they're doing that. But also because there's this community already happening, people are also continuing to create conversation in all sorts of subjects so there we've got one person that really likes to run and and they will share their their output of their map of their run and mm. you know talk about how they've stayed well we have people share what they've been up to in terms of they joined the karaoke session we run on zoom through friendship and i think you know with another probably another 50 people that will just be a self creating community that will continue to grow. And we're, we're heavily focused on that at the moment. We've been seeking funding to be able to expand it, to give it more resource, to really, really engage people, to be able to promote it beyond um, our core sort of contact point, because it's a space for all people with learned disabilities to join. It's not restricted to just anyone that uses Grace Air Services. It's for anyone with a learning disability to, to have a safe space to communicate. So. You know, one of the ways we, we had to think about it was the privacy. We wanted people to be able to find it, um, but we didn't want people just to be able to randomly engage. So we have a, you can find it, you need to ask to join. And in that you agree to a few basic housekeeping rules, you know, and we give some guidance about staying safe, such as don't share your phone number in a post and things like that. So, and that, that is a huge uh, success for us. Because yeah, it sounds fantastic. Thank you ever so much for telling us all about it. Um, I, I, I'm very curious as to where they're getting all their flour from as well, but, um, <laughs> all the bread that they're baking. Um, but I think, yeah, the peer support and, and the fact that it's become self-sustaining sounds really amazing. Um, Sabra, I was wondering if I could come to you now and talk to you about, um, cause we've talked about that kind of group communication, the one-to-one -one communication and how you've been managing that with Rana, because there's quite a creative way you've been going about that as well. Absolutely. And I, I, David, I love that story about the breadth of um, crafts and arts and people deciding for themselves what they want to make and sharing it. I just, I love it. Um, anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so with Rana, Rana doesn't use the phone. Um, she will text. Um, 
very short text messages. So this whole period has been, it's just been really difficult um, because my family has not been able to have that that face-to-face -face physical connection. So while we have been communicating sort of through run our support staff who are amazing, what we've lacked is that direct contact. So we gave a video conferencing um, a call. I think we tried WhatsApp video um, and she just didn't like it. Um, just didn't suit her, didn't work for her. So I started to make video messages for her, just recording a quick hello. Um, and after a while I thought, well, it's quite dull just me standing here saying the same thing over and over again. Um, so I began recording messages for her around the house where I've got her artwork um, hanging up or perhaps some flowers she's grown in the past that come up every year in the garden. And this developed, um, I shared it on social media and um, quite a few other family members, um, people themselves and other siblings got in touch with other pieces of art that they'd made. And so we created, uh, or I created an online gallery. Um, we called it the Happy Art Gallery. And I realize now the acronym is HAG, which is not great. So I need to change that. But um, it, it was just an amazing, um, very informal um, way of gathering together beautiful things that people had made that made them happy. And, you know, from a selfish perspective, it gave me something else to share with my sister. Um, so we, yeah, we put that out there. It's on, on my website and it's, it's just amazing. It's about 50, 50 pieces of, of our everything from soaps to knitted rabbits, um, paintings, lots of rainbows. Um, I think there might be some bread there as well and cake. Um, but it's that, it's the combination, I think, as David was saying, of community, communication and tech. And when it comes together, the social good that comes out of it is, is just brilliant. Mm, fantastic. And Matthew, I wonder if there's anything you want to say about that. It's a really good summary, Sabo, about um, community and tech. Is there anything that you'd like to add about how you've managed to um, move the festival online and, and how you've been going about that? Matthew, is there anything you want to say about how you've been moving the um, festival online and, and how that's been for you? Um, but, but, but because we can't tour the festival because of the pandemic, we've put all our festival online. It's called Oscar Bites. So um, some new screening we've got every month or every two months from, from May until January 2021. Fantastic. And have you been planning that together um, using Yes, I've it been come? speaking to my colleagues just as much as my Oscar Bright committee and we all have mild learning disabilities and so that all has sometimes challenges on Zoom but we do the best we can with what challenges we face at the moment. Great, that's fantastic. And it's important to keep that creative um, output going, I think, isn't it? Yes, it is. I think without it, I think I would just feel lost and would feel part of my life is missing, to be honest. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so mm -hmm. that will bring me on now to um, Jane. I wonder if I can ask you to talk about how you've been adapting. And I think you've had a few challenges and some support along the way. Yes, we have. Um, we um, run a very extensive um, uh, programme of uh, creative writing workshops, which is all part of our Creative Future Writers Awards. And that's a national program. So we work with some amazing um, organisations across um, England, um, New Writing North, who are, who are up in Newcastle and Gateshead, and also the National Centre for Writing in Norwich. And we run um, workshop programmes in each of these 
those areas as well as in down here with New Writing South. Um, but as well as working with those agencies, we also work with a, a whole range of social enterprises and work and write and deliver workshops through them. And that's really about extending our reach in terms of who um, we want to be able to um, take up the opportunities that we offer because very often the people that we actually want to reach and the voices that we want to hear aren't sort of front and centre in terms of taking those opportunities, uh, of knowing about those opportunities. So we really do um, work hard to make sure that those opportunities reach the people that we want to engage with. Um, for instance, um, we work with Preston Park Recovery Centre here in uh, the city, as well as an organisation called All Sorts, um, who specialise in working with young LBGTQ people. Um, and we normally would be running our workshops um, um, in at their spaces at Preston Park Recovery Centre obviously we're not able to do that but we have had we have been able to move I'd say about 80% of our program online now and we are delivering that online um, we're sort of fortunate in that creative writing does lend itself quite well to an online offer um, but of course what is missing is that um, um, you know writing is quite an isolating um, a thing to do anyway and particularly we work with a lot of artists a lot of writers who are, are living with mental health challenges and um, part of our program is to allow those writers to come into a room together and there's been some really lovely peer-to-peer -peer working that's come out of that um, the, the, the um, workshops that we've run but we're finding it's still happening even online that people are making are, are engaging and they're sharing information and they're sharing um, email contacts or phone numbers and they're starting to have those conversations out of the actual um, sessions and also we have um appointed our writer in residence, Akila Richards, who some of you may know. Um, she would have been the writer in residence at Preston Park Recovery Centre. That's obviously not able to happen. But um, PPC have been able to reach out to um, all of their community and um, you know, lots of people are, are engaging now in her online workshops that she's running. Um, so we've had real success there and we were able to respond quite quickly and our tutors have been amazing in just adapting to that. I mean, some of them had already delivered online work, but some of them hadn't and they've made that move across really effectively. And we're now looking at sort of um, running some more um, um, opportunities online because there's been such interest and such up uptake in that. Um, and the other thing that we've been doing, which I think you wanted me to talk about, was our Zoom training. Yeah. yeah. Which was an extraordinary. Um, we're, we're as well as um, our Writers Awards. We're also we're also very fortunate to. Um, be um, uh, one of the partners in the HERA partnership which is a new program of activity arts health and well-being and that's four organizations in the city the Robin Hood Health Foundation the Old Market um, ourselves Creative Future but also an amazing organization called Diversity and Ability uh, they're a national organization um, and, and they have a, um, a base here in Brighton um, and they specialize in working uh, with neurodivergent people um, and working with them we've been able to we got a sense that a lot of people that having to make this move to um, use it using zoom or using teams was a barrier um, and so we worked with them to deliver some zoom training and some uh, teams training um, uh, a short work two hour workshop um, each of the partners were able to offer in the first round offer sort of six places three places to our communities and we reached out and we had 80 people requesting that opportunity within 45 minutes um, and I was really surprised at that um, Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was really surprised at the number of people who were, wanted that support. And it was really clear to us that for an, a lot of the um, 
um, people we work with, that is a real barrier for them. So we're running another session next week. We're looking at how um, we had quite a lot of visual artists who took up the offer on that first round. And we're also looking at how we can do um, tra Zoom training, particularly uh, for uh, specifically for visual artists, um, particularly neurodivergent visual artists who engage in a very sort of uh, particular way. And we want to see how we can um, continue to support them. It's all about funding, of course, and we're looking at where we can get the resource to continue to run them. But the first sessions were so brilliantly well received and it's enabled a lot of those people now to feel more confident about um, engaging you know, online in this way. So. Yeah, that's been a really, really exciting and, and successful piece of work that we've been able to deliver. That's great. Thank you. And I think it's something that um, a lot in what you say that AbilityNet would recognise, which is that technology can be hugely empowering, but it also can act as a barrier. And, you know, that's part of our role is to support people as much as we can to um, make the best of the technology, but in no way do we think that it's easy and that it's a, a, a panacea for things either? Um, I, I know there's a lot of questions here, so I'm going to have to cherry pick, but I think it would be great to talk about, um, talked a lot about this already, about getting those diverse voices heard. And I've put particularly at this time, because um, I know Sabo is particularly passionate about this, that um, as there are so many societal challenges around, there's a real risk that some of these diverse voices will get lost in the noise so Sarah maybe I'll come to you to start and then um, if anyone else wants to stick their hand up and, and, and chip in that would be great. Yeah I think you know this period is obviously challenging for all of us um, but for some of us um, it basically COVID and lockdown just increases some of these inequalities and we talked about tech being fantastic but also a barrier um, but more widely um, people with learning disabilities face huge experience huge inequalities and everything from you know housing employment health and we've seen some absolutely horrific statistics about um, unexpected deaths of people with learning disabilities that have risen um, compared to last year so so what covid does uh, you know at this time is just exacerbate all of those things. So I think it that means that the direct voices, people's words, people's stories, um, people's creativity, it's even more important to to get that out there. You know, if that's what people want, obviously, um, because the danger is that what is happening at this time, and as as we go through as well, and we come out, we're starting to come out of this. Um, you know, what kind of landscape are we going to emerge into and what's that going to mean for part of our population, uh, which is already sort of overlooked or marginalised or segregated, however you want to sort of refer to it. So that's, and from a personal perspective, that really troubles me. Um, to take one example, my sister's social care support, um, which is fantastic, has obviously been um, very unsettled it's sort of she's had a change in staff and all of those things that she relies on that are part of her routine as it is for a lot of us we've all been unsettled by this but those things really help my sister to thrive and when that is fragile um, and when it's uncertain you don't know when it's going to go back to you know normal or the new normal I think that will have a massive impact so um, yeah I think all of these things we're talking about right now are hugely important now more than ever, really. And Jane, I wonder if I could come to you next, maybe, and talk about um, getting those voices out there. And I'm aware the writing competition you did, and this was, I think, strange coincidence, had the theme of tomorrow. When you look forward, what do, sort of a future do you see? And what's your role in terms of maintaining, getting these diverse voices out into the community? Yes, we did. Our theme uh, uh, for this year was um, tomorrow. Uh, we chose that pre-lockdown. Obviously, um, we launched in January and um, our, um, the competition in terms of submissions um, for so that you can submit uh, 2000 words prose or 
uh, poetry as well. So um, that closed at the end of May. Uh, we had 1,400 submissions to the competition this year, which is a record for us. I think lots of writers in lockdown with lots of time to write. So, <laughs> but we've been really delighted with the um, response. Um, we've we've done that shortlisting now and um, we'll take that forward to to kind of deciding the um, who's going to be our winners for 2020 it'll be quite a different year because normally we would do um, a, a showcase event for all those writers as well as the award ceremony and we also do a writer's day which we deliver as part of the London Literature Festival at South Bank um, and that's been and they've been incredibly um, supportive to us as an organisation in, in allowing us to do that very high profile event and to allow our writers to have a real platform for their work um, and of course all those writers are writing from their own perspective um, we publish an anthology each year. This is a uh, this is actually um, a couple of years ago because um, the other thing that's happened, which is really interesting, is that the sales of our anthology have really increased since lockdown. I think people are being incredibly supportive, and uh, I've actually run out of copies at home because I keep putting you in the post for people who want to read them. Um, but we do we do print an anthology each year with all that writing in it as well as um, a number of guest writers that we in, invite to um, add to that um, um, anthology in terms of that those diverse voices getting an opportunity to be heard. Um, but it's starting to have an impact within publishing. Uh, uh, Saba, you're probably aware of this as well. Um, we uh, next week i think it is there's um a, a publication called rethinking um diversity in publishing is going to be out next week and that's been work that's been um put together with the uh, uh, goldsmiths university have been doing that research as well as spread the word which is a london-based uh, writing development agency and also the bookseller uh which is this sort of industry publication with all things about books um so looking forward to seeing that that's been over over a hundred um, uh, writers from diverse backgrounds who have contributed to that um, and I think around the, the Black Lives Matters you've seen um, those voices being heard around the need for more diversity um, particularly in publishing but across the board really in terms of arts and culture um, so we're pleased that we've been part of that momentum to to kind of get that change in place um, and yeah we've got as I said before, still lots of work to do, but um, change is starting to happen incrementally. It'll always be incremental, I think, but, um, you know, you have those amazing, Bernadine Evaristo, the extraordinary Bernadine Evaristo, has written the foreword for this um, report that's about to be launched, and, you know, you're starting to see those voices um, come, to, you know, more and more to the fore, which is fantastic to see. That's great. Um, David, I wonder, um, given that you have been looking back at your long history, if there's any kind of themes that you've picked up there, um, as Jane says, the change is often incremental. Do you get a sense of how far we've come and how far we have left to go and what some of those challenges might be? I think um, in terms of how far to go, I think we're always in that position of when we're in the moment it, it we we think we're, we're we're doing really well and i think the journey has a very great distance to go um for for a true society based around equality and equity um looking backwards it, it it's you know it it seems to take so long for that incremental change to creep through. And there's very rare moments where a big step change happens. Um, but I definitely feel this moment is one of those, there's going to be a big change as we all look at how do we return from this closed down sort of position. And we have a real opportunity to rethink and reimagine services uh, for for the groups that we're trying to support in learning disabilities um, and develop a new way of working and we're, we're currently doing a lot of work at the moment using technology to to complete surveys with people to for them to inform us but look everything's different now what do you want whereas for a long time we've had well this is how everything's set up this is the structure this is the day this is your respite care this is the activities we can offer well 
in, in my particular service, we close the doors to that and we have an opportunity to come back very differently and really start to, to have a big reflection of what people have a chance to say they want from us. So we're, we're quite excited at this moment from out of this very challenging situation um, to, to get a very significant change in a relatively short period compared to how long it's taken in the past to, to move simple things. Um, you know, even for say being able to do activities in the evenings for the group that we tend to work with, often they will say they want that, but that could be very hard to get coordinated through the whole circle of support and things like that, because actually people quite often then need to change their one-to-one -one and things. But we have an opportunity to do it online as well for some of this. So we can create new activities that operate in the evening or on a Sunday and people connect in a way that's convenient to them. So I think that incremental change does take a long time. And when we do look back, we see all sorts of stories and you know we've moved from in essence, almost a prison style institutionalization to a hospital style institutionalization to a living in the community in all sorts of settings and, you know, still having elements of that institutionalization because they're quite often set up in the, the best way to support the largest number, unfortunately. And now we're looking at, well, actually in, in the department that like I work in, it's really important that when we reopen, we reopen in a in a way that makes that about smaller groups of people, that that it, it makes it much more bespoke to them. I know that's a one of those buzzwords that gets thrown around and is hard to justify, but I think we have the best chance uh, for a long time right now. So I, I, I'm very very mindful of that. It's great to hear that that hope for the future, and also as you say, you know, taking on board. Um, user experience in you know kind of like in real life I guess and online as well what people are looking for in those environments and um, so I'm mindful of time and um, so we have had some questions coming through and um, Sava I've seen one for you um, which is about um, whether you have um, what your future plans are are there stories that didn't make it into the book or have you got a new book idea that has emerged from the work done on made possible so far um there are definitely more stories um out there that deserve to be told um the so there weren't stories that uh that we gathered and then didn't make it in um so that that wasn't to answer that question that that wasn't the case um but yeah there is something i'm working on um developing from this um but for the moment um the kind of immediate uh, aftermath of the publication is three three weeks old the book um so i think uh matthew and, and i and all the other contributors you know we're just enjoying having it out there finally um given it was two just over two years in the making so I think um, to have it out there is brilliant. Um, yes, I would like to continue and develop some of the threads uh, from it. I don't know exactly how yet, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just brilliant to, to have it there. And, and also to, to talking about other stories, um, I hope it encourages other people to share their stories um, because this is, you know, eight, incredible people defining success for themselves um, in their own ways and and that's relevant to everybody really but thank you for the question great um, and um, there's a question here as well about how open to change are the organizations that are providing services um, and particularly around housing and daily living services I don't know if anyone's got any experience of that No. I, I think I, I, can, I can speak uh, on behalf of Grace Air. We have housing and, and community services and things like that. As you just heard me talk about for, for our active lives services, we're really open to this moment being a real opportunity for change. And I think Grace Air fully is always looking at how do we improve? How do we adapt? How do we reflect what people want? 
Um, and I think, you know, with a, a charity with such a long history, it, it's still trying to always think that it's not doing a good enough job. Um, and I think if, if you have that in your mindset, then you're constantly looking for the next way to do something or the next way to improve something. So I know that for Grace Air, it's a really important element of now and our future is to constantly be challenging ourselves to, to better reflect what people are asking for. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that that is something that's reflected across the community as well. Um, and there was another question as well, which is to do with how you've been adapting your services, which is whether you've had to um, step in at all in terms of the community, have people been, been following the rules? Has there been any kind of, and if so, how have you managed that as well? Yeah, um, I would believe this would be in response to the, the, the friendship group where I talked about we have some core rules or, or guidance. Um, and so far, no one's pushed the line. Um, it's been amazing. It's been approached with a great sense of community. And I think because we, we do have that sort of, you've got to go through that door to get in and we approve it. So we, we keep maybe potentially people that may look to take advantage of, of the, the situation. We sort of may see that coming through in the invites, but to my knowledge, we haven't refused any invitations. We haven't had any particular breaches of the rules, but our, our agreed sort of response to it is to initially have a conversation, just like we would when we're trying to support people to understand um, relationship boundaries, friendship boundaries, professional boundaries, uh, because quite often we have that situation where the professional relationship is seen more as a friendship uh, and actually there's a, there's a relationship there that that's not what we want to create there for them, that's not our role. Um, and so we've always taken the approach of educate first, you know, hopefully we won't ever get to the point where we have to ban someone from the Facebook group. We, we, we would tread very carefully in that area, but we do respect the element of safeguarding that we have. We are helping coordinate this at this moment. It is designed to be a safe space, mm. but uh, definitely starts with a conversation if anyone did push. Uh, but so far we haven't had any issues in, in the three months that we've been heavily promoting it. And that might be down to the numbers. You know, that, that it's not so huge yet that there's that, that risk. But yeah, we, we haven't had it, but we would discuss first. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think we've just got time for one final question. Um, I've seen somebody asking, Sava, how um, Rana has received your videos um, and what how they've gone down with her. Well, what a great question. Um, well, uh, the ideal thing would be for Rana to send me a video back. I'm still, I'm hoping one day that's going to happen if, if she wants it to. Uh, she sends very minimal, uh, characteristically minimal text messages back. So I got one that said, good, um, which was high praise. Um, and another one said, uh, that said, that, that's kind. Um, which is when I, I talked about some of the art that had been um, that we shared on the online gallery. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's positive. Um, it's a positive response. Um, Rana always sends very short but sweet messages back. So I know that um, I know that she she appreciates that. Interestingly, my mother has also been sending video messages and Rana's actually asking my mother to send her more which is interesting because I haven't had that demand. So I think there's a kind of hierarchy in the, um, in the popularity stakes here within the family that I'm going to have to, you know, I'm getting quite competitive about that, but I, I know she likes them and I know because I've spoken to her staff about it as well. So um, yeah, thank you for that question. That's great. Um, so I think we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I would just like to, again, thank all the um, participants who've joined us today and to thank all the panelists. I think it's been a really great discussion and the word that is singing out to me is celebration. I really feel like it's been um, a theme that everybody has talked about um, and I'm really curious about um, what comes next from all the organisations and the individuals that we've spoken to. Um, when we post the information afterwards we will also put up 
some related links. So I'll make sure that um, I find the link for Oscar Bite because it'd be great to watch some of those those films and see how that's all coming together. Um, Jane, it'd be great if you could keep us in touch about when the next anthology is due. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, do keep in touch and let us know how all the projects are going. Um, and because um, I know that Zoom ends quite abruptly, just finally to say again, a big thank you to all of you um, for joining us today um, and watch out for the email and the update and all the information. So thanks everybody and take care. Thank, thank you. you. It's been lovely. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.